Hey, fellow workers, welcome back to the Alberta Worker Podcast. You are tuning in to episode five of season one, and I'm happy to announce our guest today, Michelle Robinson, who is the host of the Native Calgarian Podcast. Welcome, Michelle, to the Alberta Worker Podcast. Well, I'm really honored to be here with you, Kim. Great. Uh, so let's just get right into it. Tell us your life story. Like, where did you grow up? What was your family like? Where you went to school? And then as you're doing that, just try to incorporate your personal labor history as well. Yeah, that sounds great. Well, first of all, happy Pride Month and happy <laughs> uh, Indigenous Peoples Month. I really like people to kind of start with a land acknowledgement. And this one actually will uh, kind of apply to both Kim and I, because although he's in Lethbridge and I'm in Calgary, we're, we're in Treaty 7 territory. So, Oki, Nagana Go, Meko Che, Chesokomaki, or Dekot, Nagotine Sigu. My name is Red Thunder Woman. My English married name is Michelle Robinson. I use she and her pronouns. I'm speaking to you on the lands of the Nitsitapi, which is the Blackfoot Confederacy. The Blackfoot south of the imposed U.S.-Canadian border are the Blackfeet. North of the border are the Siksika, Gunai, and Bagani of the Confederacy. These lands are Treaty 7, signed September 22, 1877, with signatures that include the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Wesley Chiniki Bears Pond Nations of the Stoney, and the Dene from Sutina. I acknowledge all First Nation, Métis, Inuit status, and non-status across Turtle Island as the keepers of these lands, and all non-Indigenous are treaty partners with the government siding on your behalf. As it is Pride Month, I think it's important to understand the straight agenda and gendered violence was and is forced on these lands by Christian outsiders. Land acknowledgements are critical for creating a safer space for Indigenous, as well as honoring the host as the guest, and uh, acknowledging your role as a treaty partner in a so-called time of reconciliation. So start there because it's really important that we acknowledge whose land that we're on. We're supposed to be in a time of reconciliation. Uh, we're supposed to be treaty partners. And I think you and I have gone through the Alberta education system. And we know that we are not taught any of that. So <laughs> it's important to start there. I guess when it comes to my worker history, boy, only in retrospect do I see how as a Native woman, there are only certain jobs I can get. And uh, when I do get jobs in different places, what people will say to me. Alberta is actually not that friendly towards women, or at least it wasn't in my world. So just to give you some background, I was born here in Calgary. My mom was from Yellowknife. She came down to state to uh, take, I think they called it secretary stuff at that time, uh, business administration type work, and met my dad and got pregnant, and here I am. I was born in uh, 1977 in Calgary, and at that time, a lot of the services that you see here in Calgary weren't here. It was way less the population. At that time, my first memories of life were domestic violence, actually. So my uh, white father, who is, uh, I'm a product of the Mayflower from him, actually, and uh, part of the American Revolution. And on uh, my mom's side, I'm uh, Indian by the Canadian standard. And I recommend that folks who are not Native don't say that word, but I live under the Indian Act. So I get to say that, even though that's like saying the N word or anything. And I think most Canadians understand if we had a Jew Act or any other type of act that really segregated people like that, that would be absolutely a human rights violation. But that's embedded in our Canadian constitution. Getting that to change is going to be very difficult. Uh, my parents obviously did not get along. Uh, eventually they um, separated. And I ended up moving to Fort McMurray with my father. And then we only lived there for two years during the worst of it. And then moved to Sylvan Lake. So I basically grew up in Sylvan Lake, Alberta. And at that time, it had a flourishing water slide. It had lake, obviously. And it, there weren't that many people. When I was there, it was only about 2,000 people. And, uh, you know, there literally were cabins. Now there are full, full out houses on these little cabin lots. And now, like, there's 13,000 people, there's, uh, you know, tourists that come every summer. So it's a very different world even now than what it was when I was growing up there. And, How old uh, were again, you when you moved there? So this would have been 83 or 84, something like that. That I, I had like lived six there. or seven. Yep. I graduated high school in 94. My husband and I, we met in high school. We actually uh, moved to Calgary together and got married in 96. We've been together ever since. Were you together in high school? Were you a couple yeah. in high school? Nice. Actually, we first met in grade four and five. So he was <laughs> in grade five, I was in grade four. And Sylvan Lake was small enough that they had like class splits. Mm -hmm. So we were in a split class together. That's actually where we first met. And then uh, I was dating one of his friends. And that was when we seen each other again. And of course, that didn't work out with his friend because he was a moron. So 
ended up uh, making googly eyes with that guy. And before you know it, we're married. And well, I guess my working started in Sylvan Lake, though, obviously. Um, I worked at Subway. They had like a 7-Eleven, but it was it wasn't called 7-Eleven, but it was open 24-7. Worked there for a bit. I was a waitress in the summer at a um, place that served breakfast for an inn. A waitress at the marina at a time as well. So those were uh, actually paid jobs that I had done. I started volunteering when I was in Sylvan Lake as well, much to the chagrin of my father. So uh, when you come into our house, my childhood home, there's a sign that says, this is a union house. <laughs> and uh, my father was a union boilermaker, actually. So he worked all over Alberta all the time. And my stepmom was a stay-at-home mom. So um, we just stayed at home and did our thing while he worked. And he just retired, actually. He's just started to get his pension. So he's doing pretty good. I think they're going to sell their boat. They just got a boat. After I left, of course, they got a boat. Of course. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. And But they, they like to go fishing. They would uh, use their boat very differently than I would have used it anyway. So actually, a, another paid gig I had when I was young was I joined Sea Cadets. There was a bus that came from Penhold, and it would pick up all the farm kids that stopped in Innisvale, uh, Sylvan Lake, and went out to the Red Deer Armory. And we um, had sea cadets, and this was before Chrétien's cuts to the military. It was some, one of my first jobs was when I went to HMCS Quadra and took um, two wiki. But they only pay you enough that you can't even break even when it comes to like deodorant and such. So it's not much of a pay, or it wasn't back then anyway. So I guess my last year was in 92 that I went. The human rights were just being brought in and the start of the Chrétien cuts. So I know that... Um, Cadets has changed drastically from the time that I ever took it. So the human rights was probably a really positive thing. When you think about what we did as kids, that was probably really wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I got to, you know, shoot off rifles with bullets. And uh, it was fun. I had a ton of fun doing it at that time. But I'm sure in retrospect, I'd never let my daughter go and do what I did in any capacity. Yeah, I did air <laughs> cadets for a year when I was... 11 or 12 something like that mostly just practice marching we did do a camp in the summertime but other than that if we just spent the entire time marching so it, i didn't last very long you know i didn't like sea cadets at first for that exact reason but then they said that they would send me to uh quadra to uh comox bc so i went there for two weeks and i went three weeks and then i went six weeks and it was great so i, I really enjoyed going out there you know they make you jump in the ocean with like just your swimsuit on all the time it was a lot of fun actually nice so I learned a lot of good skills there anyway, and I, I really appreciated that. But, you know, waitressing was more of a, you know, at the time I was good looking and, and little and everybody was like, oh, here, take my money because I'm a drunk tourist from Calgary with way too much money. So it was great making uh, good money then. But I mean, that's not something you can live off and that's not something you should do your entire life anyway. But you can and I respect people who do it. I have two younger brothers. Uh, one works for the town of Sylvan Lake. Uh, another one, he used to work for the Brick and now he sells like ATVs up in Fort McMurray. And I think he might be relocating to Calgary here shortly. So it, it's interesting um, where they all ended up as well. But for me, I ended up in Calgary. I, I took uh, night classes at SAIT and became a, a drafter. And so I drafted wells and pipelines and access route and uh, maps for oil companies, basically, as they did uh, production. And then um, I had my baby and I stayed home. So I haven't gone really back into the workforce, but uh, because I experienced so much racism in the hospital, I um, have really changed the way I look at my life. And I've really had to embrace my indigeneity, really talk about racism to folks because I don't want another indigenous woman trying to give birth to have to go through what I went through. And I certainly don't want indigenous people to be going through what they're going through, period. It's a real state, I think, on Canada that we were still here. So I, I advocate a lot for Indigenous rights and I've gotten very political. I was lucky enough to get right into the executive for the Liberal Party of Canada federally. With that position, it's uh, through something called the Indigenous Peoples Commission. We talk about Indigenous policy across the nation. And sometimes they institute it, sometimes they don't. And sometimes they do when they said they wouldn't. A great example of that would be the Inuit governor general. That was one of the policies I put forward was that it would switch from English to French to Indigenous. And it actually failed. But now we have an Inuit governor general. So did it? <laughs> <laughs> I've done all sorts of different work 
over the course of time, I've done really fun stuff. Like I did mascotting for extra money for Christmas one year. And funny enough, I just reconnected with my boss. She was a, she is a Marilyn Monroe impersonator here in the city. Oh, and really? uh, our friend who's an Elvis impersonator, he <laughs> uh, was on the CBC yesterday. I couldn't believe it. So that was great. That's awesome. And then, uh, yeah, I seen him at an Aboriginal Friendship Centre event last week and got to finally reconnect to him after years of being apart. So that was really great. So yeah, I've done all sorts of weird jobs, great jobs, fun jobs, awful jobs. Uh, one that I would love to tell you about is working for a registry for five minutes. Boy, oh boy. And that was very recent. And I caught COVID again. So there's no rights for you when you're, you know, still in your three month uh, window there. Right. So that was unpaid and it was awful. And uh, I feel like I'm just starting to recover. Unpaid? You said you were unpaid during that position? Uh, just during when I had COVID and I had oh. to take that week off. Right? Oh, I see. No so, sick leave. Yeah. Uh. No. No, because I was still in my three month uh, temporary period, right? Oh, that sucks. And then you have to take two weeks off. Was it during the mandatory two weeks no, isolation? No, actually, they had just started switching the uh, requirements. You know, I wasn't testing. I didn't feel bad anymore. So I went back after a week, put in my notice, and they, they let me go right away. Um, <laughs> oh but what was interesting about that job was that I got to learn uh, just above minimum wage how many gaps there are in the system when it comes to registration and discriminatory practices that just continue because nobody calls it out. It's funny, I, I was always told, oh, that's such a good job. Everybody would want to get that job, but it's not a good job at all. You're always under threat of making like a, a $10,000 uh, mistake that the registry would be fined for. And you have to look people dead in the eye. I had this uh, one couple that were black and uh, she was pregnant. They had gotten insurance from Nigeria that turned out for whatever reason, Alberta Healthcare doesn't accept. She's bleeding and I'm not allowed to give her her healthcare number because she has a SIN number and they, we don't accept that as proof of who you are. It was ridiculous. Oh my goodness. It was awful. I, I hated it. And then just silly things like, um, you, you know, if you have a long last name, um, there's only so many characters that you can put in for your last name. So I, I was just really like taken aback at how stupid some of the things were. Another thing that I was just disgusted by was that if you're, you are transgender you know, it's a really expensive process of fingerprinting, name changing, getting all of that done. I, I just don't know how we are okay with that. I just don't understand that at all. <laughs> Our 17 year old went through that process, name change. Yeah, they had to do the whole fingerprinting at the police station. We had to apply to get their name changed. And yeah, it was several hundred dollars for the entire process. And it was a nightmare. And I totally get the whole really? long name. I, mean, I don't have a long last name, but I have three middle names and they often don't fit into government systems. And some of our children have accented letters in their names. I think it's fixed now, but when they were born, you couldn't input accented letters into their systems and stuff. So yeah, I totally get it. Well, and it is a reflection a bit of our healthcare system. We have some nurses that just don't have the time and patience to fill in the original registration that they do at the hospital. So then you have to fix it later, which I think is ridiculous. Like uh, there's just so many levels of this is a ridiculous process. I can't believe it. And yet, you know, you could renew from Ontario a lot of your registration and such like it was just so incredible like the vast difference of what we are willing to accommodate for business and what we're not for people so so many things to kind of discuss there for workers let me tell you oh i i guess there, there's a lot to say too about folks that were houseless and these programs that these alpha houses and, and types will do to help them get some ID. And it, it's just such a, a cycle, you know, where you either the police ruin your ID, it gets stolen or it get lost or stolen at one of those shelters. The shelters are not safe places. Sure. And then you have to go through the process over and over and over again. It's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Our system's just not set up to help people thrive and succeed in life. Only certain no. people, people who already have privilege. A hundred percent. Yeah. So the couple of things I'm interested in that you were talking about. So what was it like growing up in a home where your dad was uh, part of a union? Oh, um, well, it was very toxic male, not going to lie. And I, it really turned me off of unions until I started to see the good of them when my friends became of age and uh, would join like a nurse's union. And I would see the positive impact of a union. 
but for me I've seen a lot of really toxic males who like to go drinking all the time just mean-spirited people. I have an uncle who uh, was originally from Yellowknife and uh, part of a miners union up there. There was so much violence. Some, somebody was actually murdered uh, during one of their strikes. Oh, and wow. this was the one uncle, native uncle that my dad like really liked. So he would have him over and talk. And my, so my uncle Bob is one of my uncles that I've been allowed to just be with my entire life. Anyway, he, he got out of that. Um, they went on strike and he went to uh, post-secondary education and as a result then became part of the referees actually up in Yellowknife and he did driver training. So okay. if you're from Yellowknife and uh, Bob is your driver instructor, you know, he, he wasn't fun and easy, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> but I've always had him as fun and easy. He <laughs> and um, anyway, he, uh, he did retire. My auntie um, that he married, uh, she's Ukrainian, she retired and she was in part of the justice system. So uh, they're now retired and, and enjoying life. But it's just so funny, because the union aspect really, it, it just shook me as negative, violent and mean, because uh, it was fought they always talked about fighting. And then my dad, uh, he did go on strike. And then we were in poverty for that short period of time that they were on strike. I want to say it was about a year. And uh, oh, wow. yeah, but I, I mean, growing up in a union house, you can like, there's homophobia, racism, all these things that were happening in my house that maybe isn't for all union houses, but it was in mine. The one word that was worse than any of the other words was scab. So I knew you never, never, never cross a p picket line yeah. and that you um, support people if they are on strike. So like if when Safeway went on strike or other places, like you don't shop there. If Coke or Pepsi are on strike, you don't shop there. You know, these are things that were really instilled in me as a child, really important to me. And um, to this day, like there are things I, I don't generally like to use uh, those self checkouts. Uh, you have to at Walmart because it's just cheaper to go there and I hate going there, but you know, we're in a really bad time right now. Absolutely. Anyway, I don't like going to self checkouts because as my dad says, that's a, there's a union job there. You know, you should, exactly. there should be, a, if it's an important uh, position, there should be a union job and um, little things like he is a big proponent of calling three one one because you're supporting union jobs, right? You could easily go outside and clean up something on your road, but the, he'd get mad and be like, no, 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 no. That's a union job. That's what it was like growing up uh, in a union house. I would see my dad have, you know, arguments with people over it too, all the time. And, you know, maybe that's why I, I don't mind losing friends, but very principled on those things where it comes to, you know, you're entitled to unemployment. It's not something that is a, a luxury, like you're entitled to it, you've worked for it. And the unions really help teach him how to conservatives would say work the system, but it's not like that. Like when you are working hard at your job as a boiler maker, your body is impacted. You're working night shifts. You're working uh, 18 hour shifts sometimes. Like it's ridiculous the amount of hard labor you do as a, as a tradesperson. So you are entitled to take time off and, and get that maximum amount. And the unions help kind of teach you how to navigate that system, which as a person who's not part of a union and my husband not part of a union. Um, when we were hitting the unemployment circuit with this COVID, so today is uh, the end of June, and we have unemployment from December, we still haven't gotten, we have nobody advocating for us because you have to take like Saturday off of work in order to make the phone call to the government in order to try to see what the hiccup is. Uh, the original company he worked for gave him a crappy ROE that they messed up with his hours, the time he started everything. So they had to redo the process. But the government isn't set up for the workers, they're set up for corporations. So if you don't have the PIN number and you don't go through their process in their way, then you know, you're know you not given those EI benefits, but we've also gotten a message from them that we're going to owe on CERB. So, wow. you know, like if they would just pay us for December, it would probably even out the CERB, but we haven't even got there yet because that happens in Ottawa. It's a bureaucracy and who wants to waste their Saturday calling over all of this, right? I can definitely tell you growing up a union house, like my dad, he's mad about my husband not getting his unemployment at this rate because, and he's like, I'll call. <laughs> but that's not how it works. <laughs> I wish I'm not 14 like, anymore, Dad. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> so it is 
kind of funny growing up in a union house and, and then trying to explain to conservatives or people of affluence who, who don't understand what it's like uh, working, one, but working hard, having your body like take a toll from that work. And then doing that in my dad's case, like he did it his entire working career. The average life expectancy for a boiler maker isn't that, that high. So every extra year we got from him, I was like, yeah, beat those odds. Yeah, proven yeah. that stat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is really scary too when you're a kid knowing that your dad's gonna die at like 54 and he's like you know 48. <laughs> it's like this sucks. <laughs> That's kind of what it was like and then uh, of course now that I'm older obviously you see um, the police for example they have these ridiculous utility belts and they they have back problems and such from it. Out of all of the things your union could be fighting for the basics should be there, like your your bodily functions, right? I, oh, another thing I was taught from my dad, never, never, never work if you feel unsafe, ever. Right. You know, you have yeah. the right to say no to work. I've never had to do that before. Probably, maybe I should have, but I never felt, you know, I had to say, no, I'm done doing this job because of an unsafe working condition. For the most part, because I haven't had to do hard work like he's had to or my husband uh, being out in the survey industry, out in the field. Like, he's never said that, but we've often wondered if his extreme allergy reactions were because he had a small exposure to some gas or something while he was out in the field, we'll never know. It is important to know your rights as a worker, but I would argue one of the things that were happening uh, in his last years of uh, union work was the decimation, decimation of the unions up in Fort McMurray. And as a result, he said, you know, you're just going to see more deaths. And sure enough, we see more and more deaths happening up in Fort McMurray as you see the unions being decimated. At the time, he was the Federal Minister for Immigration, Jason Kenney. And that was highly impacting because they were bringing in temporary foreign workers and migrant yeah. workers to do that work. Yeah. And then um, now as the premier, he's just decimated everything that he possibly can in every aspect he can. So he's not here for the workers. I think we know that from what the teachers and the um, doctors and the nurses are saying. And even a lot of these positions, like I actively fight against because unfortunately, a lot of these positions are incredibly inherently racist and they teach really racist material. And our people are dying in the hospitals because of the lack of care that uh, comes from racism. I can give examples of that as well, if you'd like, but uh, the more to focus on the workers, you know, ironically, I would still fight for their rights. I would go on a picket line for them anytime because I was raised to believe that's the right thing to do. And I do believe that. And I know that every single right we've ever had is uh, because of a worker, because of union and workers. So I support um, unions and workers unconditionally because I was raised to, but it also because now that I'm older, it makes sense. And you see right now in 2022, the corporations making so much money and us all struggling, um, frankly. And yeah. we our, our rights have been eliminated in so many ways. I've heard so many people over the years talk about unions were great. At one time, they brought in, you know, 40 hour work week and various benefits like EI and, and whatever else. But we don't really need the unions anymore because we have all those things. And what people don't realize is that companies are trying to get rid of the rights that unions fought for. And that's one of the reasons why we need unions. It's because we need to make sure that we collectively as workers are coming together to try to protect those fought for rights. Another thing that I was curious about, you mentioned that you're a stay-at-home parent. We haven't really talked about that in my other interviews. So what has that been like? You said that you've been focusing on that for a few years. I still consider that to be labor, labor that has to be performed and in an indirect way helps to contribute to the economy. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, let me tell you, it's been really eye-opening. When I talk about patriarchy, I don't think people really unpack what that means. So for example, one of the reasons why I stayed at home was because ultimately my husband made more money than I did. Obvious decision for me to stay at home. But um, if you look at the, the market, women just don't make dollar to dollar funding as men. That within itself is wrong. And this is exactly why we need to continue focusing on workers and union rights because there should be dollar to dollar funding. And I was just watching a video of their Norwegian countries. They literally have fines for companies that don't pay per day dollar to dollar funding for women to men. Wow. So like, let, let's start there. Holy. Um, uh, yeah. But as a stay at home mom, what I have found in Alberta, it is set up 
So women are expected to do ridiculous amounts of free labor. Obviously, I was involved as I could be with my daughter's schooling. What a lot of people may not know is the schools are not actually set up. They don't actually have hired like cooks or anything like that in their lunchrooms. So very rarely do kids get like a hot meal. There's very few um, lunch programs that are actually set up. You know, I think it was a Wednesday or something we picked that we would do hot dogs or whatever for the kids. And, you know, it changed and, and it would get, become more... Uh, progressive as different parents would come in and figure out different programs, et cetera, et cetera, with the idea that money would go to something like a, a parent council. So the parent councils are all non-union. Again, my dad, he's a big believer that half of the stuff that I would volunteer for should be paid. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I would love to see parent councils paid for dad. Holy, something that I ran about because I was really upset about. I live in Calgary's Northeast. Uh, it's I live in a place that's called Abbeydale. It's part of uh, the Greater Forest Lawn. Although a lot of folks in Abbeydale hate that it's considered that and like to pretend that we are somehow better than the rest of Forest Lawn when we're not. Right. Anyway, this uh, area here, it was basically developed in the early 80s. And as a result, a lot of the playgrounds have kind of outlived their time. So they had to be pulled and replaced. Ironically, there's only a small fund in the provincial coffers to allow children to have playgrounds and all of the playgrounds in this area need redoing and i was like you know again with urban planning again with this idea of planning at a provincial level like there should always be this in the docket as an understanding this has to be done but note the onus is on parents to do the organizing the fundraising, putting together the grants. And I just watched a friend of mine literally took her six years of putting together all of this to finally get put a playground in a Catholic run school. Wow. And she did so much work. I'm so proud of the work she did, but it's not okay that she was having to do that on her nightstand every day, trying to get grants and letters together and getting getting all of this work done. I, I just, I will never understand why people think that is acceptable, but yet as we are speaking, I know that there are thousands of parents across Alberta right now doing that work in their community right now to try to get something as simple as a playground up to date, modern playground up to date in their in their area because of the development and, and uh, what needs to be updated. So, yeah. you know, these the, it, it's just, a, it's shocking to me you know, the amount of free labor that is expected, the amount of fundraisers that parents are expected to do, bottle drives, all sorts of uh, different free labor that we are expected to do. And then only then will, you know, provincial and federal funding give in a third of that. You're expected to fundraise a third, the province will give you the other third, and the, the federal government will give you the other third. And I just... Right. I just don't respect that. There's a reason why we have government. There's a reason why there should be better planning on that, but it's not being done. So I did run municipally. I think I was the first First Nation to run municipally. And then provincially I ran in the last election, or I guess it was 2017. 2019, I ran provincially and 2017 municipally. But federally, I've I've stayed the course and, and been really involved in the Indigenous Peoples Commission and my local Liberal EDA. So those are things that I do for free because the only way you change a system is systemically. So I tried to put my volunteer efforts towards that. But even there, I think it should be paid as well. It really upsets me that it's not. But, you know, our state of democracy if we could have a long discussion on that alone. But the bigger thing is, is that people aren't engaged in it and they have assumptions about who gets paid to do what. And it's not about that. It's about free labor. From the time that you're about 14, you're expected to do free labor and volunteer in order to make your resume look good so that you can start getting good jobs, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't volunteer, you're not considered somehow a balanced person in the eyes of an employer. I just think it's so ridiculous some of the standards that we've put on ourselves when it comes to, I would argue, even menial jobs. There's no really such thing as a menial job. Like my brother, he does garbage pickup. If he didn't do garbage pickup, that would be the worst thing in the world. Every job matters, but it's incredible what you're expected to do now in order to get a job. If my name wasn't Michelle Robinson, I probably wouldn't have had the opportunities I did have because a lot of employers will discriminate if they know that you're a First Nation. You know, you, so. you probably would have got a lot fewer callbacks on your resume if you had a different last name. I have to whitewash my um, resume in order to get a just a regular job. If I put in all of my Indigenous uh, volunteer work, it would be a detriment uh, yeah. for me getting a position.
Yeah. Sadly. Yeah. So um, your point about all that free labor, it leads to another interesting idea as well, I think. And that's how society looks at domestic labor in general. I mean, not only are stay-at-home parents expected to do all this labor for free, but the labor that they do do, you know, such as like caregiving and meal prep and all that sort of stuff, when it's done by workers in the economy, that work is also looked down upon like food services employees right they should be minimum wage and it shouldn't be a full-time job it's just to help prepare you for the job market so it's not even seen as part of the job market and then people who go in and do house cleaning for example they're looked down upon so anything that a stay-at-home parent does as part of domestic labor when it's done by workers in the in the economy it's viewed as being not worthy, as menial to use the word that you were using as well. So it just shows you that our society just doesn't see the domestic labor that's performed by stay-at-home parents as valid labor, even though stay-at-home parents help to make sure that people who enter into the workforce, you know, that they have clean clothes and food to eat and that they're healthy and all those sorts of things as well. So they contribute to the economy. They make sure that there are workers constantly going into the economy. And that's something that we just don't seem to to appreciate as a society. I couldn't agree more. And I um, I just see it everywhere all the time. And it, when I talk about fighting the patriarchy, that's what I'm talking about because men are more likely to be hired over women and men are more likely to make more money than a woman. You know, that that's just unfair right there, let alone as an Indigenous person. Person. I've been really struggling with how to raise my daughter in this world that doesn't appreciate Indigenous women, but also will purposely get away with not paying her dollar to dollar funding. She is talking about going into the trades, which I'm actually quite happy about because, you know, I've been seeing how the world operates and ethically, I don't know how a lot of people sleep at night, at least with trades, it's decent work. <laughs> You're not exploiting somebody else's labor. You're doing your own labor. But the problem is, is that it doesn't take much to get hurt. When we talk about menial labor and how wrong that is, the first place I think about are meat packing plants, where we have temporary farmer workers. We have a lot of new uh, migrant workers, a lot of newcomers, refugees that are expected to do that job with very few rights in my opinion. I've been meaning to have uh, one of the lead voices, in my opinion, in, in the province on this. Her name is Vanessa Ortez, and she works for a group called Migrant Alberta. And she did an article and talk, talked about how during COVID, she would show up with a bunch of vaccines to distribute to the workers and they wouldn't allow it. Um, you know, wow. <laughs> it, it wasn't even going to cost them anything. And they still didn't want to vaccinate the workers. And, well, um, and you just look at the meatpacking plants during the first wave of the pandemic and how hard hit the workers were hit there because of the work right, conditions. Right. That out of all places should be unionized. I think they deserve way more rights. And yeah, that would mean an increase in food costs, but I'm sorry, <laughs> it should be worth something. And we're already um, getting increased food costs and without increases to worker pay. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I see a lot of the homeless population. I've uh, spoke to many of them. They'll get hurt on one of these job sites and not have any rights. You know, Asian Alberta, it's not easy and fun to apply for. And uh, folks with like disabilities that are like people in a wheelchair, like they have a hard time living off of what they give them, let alone having a, a really high quality standard of life like that there's all of these devices are so expensive i can't wrap my mind around how people are okay with people with handicaps being homeless being mistreated uh being unable to have proper wheelchairs un unable to have proper devices in general and meanwhile you know we have people making multi-billions of dollars in um oil companies and such right around here. It's about to be stampede season. So we're going to have, you know, free stampede breakfasts everywhere. While that's wonderful, it just shows like they're what we value. We value, you know, a 10-day party where oil companies will pay for alcohol and food that easily could have been distributed in such a more equitable way all across the province. And you know, just before coming on here, I was listening to the CBC and they were talking about, you know, basically the collapse of our healthcare. I was just in there with my friend who had uh, had to go to emergency. It's ridiculous. Uh, people are dying of heart attacks. People are dying 
of uh, healthcare services that we should be able to access that we can't anymore. We are not investing into the very things that we pay government for, which is, you know, putting them in a good education system, which they necessarily are not in. They're being told lies about Indigenous people, 100%. They're being told lies about uh, how the East works, how governance works. We just had a UCP candidate talking to Elon Musk about private data. Um, I, oh, right. Daniel I, I just, Smith. Yeah, I just can't understand how we're here. You know, in, in a healthy yeah. democracy, in a healthy society, we just understand you take care of folks with uh, disabilities. Yeah. You give people's union rights. I feel like the 80s were better when it came to union rights and understanding of fair society and not in a negative way. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. And I just live in a really selfish world right now, I feel like. And right. I, I ran to try to have a more equitable uh, world that we're living in, safe consumption sites. Like I, I remember when Ralph Klein cut them, cut mental health services in general, and then cut services for folks with disabilities. And I just thought, how do you sleep at night? How do you yeah. do that? How do yeah. you cut that service? knowing that we would have people with mental health issues and disabilities on the streets. And there's a really great expression that you can really tell the state of a society by how it treats its weakest people. And I feel like uh, this is definitely a doggy world that we yeah. live in here in Alberta. Totally and um, I think that workers' rights are probably the fundamental way that we're going to get any sort of equity back. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Uh, like I think worker rights are fundamental to attack some of these cuts to critical services and stuff. Because a lot of the people who end up on some of these services is because of the way that they were treated. You know, somebody might get injured on the job and then can't go to work anymore. And then down the road, they end up homeless, right? Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. So one question that I always ask my guests, and this is something you sort of already touched on this, but how has your intersections of marginalization influenced your experiences as a worker? And like by what I mean by that is like how is your gender, your ethnicity, your sexual orientation, your religion, whatever it happens to be, how has that played into how you experienced the workplace as a worker, other than just being you know part of the working class? I think a lot of um, Albertans don't like to identify as being part of the working class. I think that is its own stigma, ironically, when the majority of us are working class. Even those who think they're middle class, like it doesn't take much to lose that middle class status. And at the end of the day, you're still a worker right? Like at the end of the day, you're still doing a job that you need to um, usually use your body in a stressful way in order to make ends meet. So Absolutely. I, I'll always be working class. I'll be proud to be working class. Uh, obviously, I just hope to teach my daughter to be a productive part of the working class in a way that's ethical and not immoral. The question that you had talked about, I, I was just telling this story yesterday I used to draft wells and pipelines and I, I worked for a couple of different companies and one of the ones I left, one of my uncles had passed away. He had come home from China. He was working in China and it was Christmas time and he had to get some dental work done and uh, they put him under and he didn't wake up. So we had to uh, bury him up in Yellowknife and he, he died in Edmonton. So our family over Christmas holidays ended up going up to Yellowknife to bury him. This was, I guess, 2001, two. So for folks, you may not remember these times, but we didn't all have cell phones at that time. <laughs> we, uh, we had to do things like leave messages and emails for our bosses. And that's what I had done uh, when we, I found out my uncle passed away. So I, I took a week off of work without really touching base. And when I got back, my boss um, talked to me and he said, you know, how many aunts and uncles do you have? And I said, lots. And he goes, yeah, well, you can't just take off for a week whenever one of your aunts or uncles dies. Wow. And I thought, I wonder if you would have said that to me if I was white. Yeah. I've always tried to give people the benefit of the doubt and think, you know, maybe you would have said that to anybody. But then the more I thought about it, I was like, I think that was just, I'm a white man and I can talk down to this little indigenous woman who thinks she can just take off and bury her relatives anytime. And I think that people don't understand how embedded racism and sexism really is that, you know, he felt very comfortable saying that to me time. My mom has five siblings. My birth father has 10 siblings. My stepfather has four siblings. And I highly doubt if I was in your situation that that would have happened to me. Right? Like I accepted, I probably would have unpaid leave and it was. That's hard. Like, you know, you have to bury a relative. You have to take a week off of work. 
I don't know about you, but I don't have a lot of give when it comes to taking a week off of work, right? It was really, um, really disheartening to hear that. So I, I obviously knew he didn't respect me. So I took off and went to another company that would let me as soon as they hired me. And that's where I ended up having uh, my maternity leave from as well. That's, that's kind of where I was at. That really showed me how uh, never forget in the eyes of employer, you're just another native and they yeah. don't respect native people in Alberta. And I've been told that my entire life. I want to change that. You know, I don't like being called one of the good ones. I know people mean that in a good way yeah. and that they're, they think they're complimenting me. They say that because ultimately they believe Indigenous as a whole are lesser. So it's okay to say that to people. Yeah, they're saying you're, you're a good one because you're the exception. Even though they think they're being nice, they're actually being racist. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And and like the average Albertan, like they don't think they're racist. Um, a great example is that sundry rodeo incident that just happened. Right. And, you know, people are like, oh, it was just a political statement. And it's like, you don't use somebody's religion and, and, and turban and beard as a political statement in that way. Like that's just racism. You know, racism is so embedded here that people don't even know when they're being racist. And uh, at a certain point, you kind of start unpacking that and you just kind of get really tired of it. And there's actually something called racial battle fatigue. I talked to the professors that really coined that term in the States and they said it was okay for me to use that. So I've been trying to really empower my people of reminding them like those little things that are said to us every day. I was with a person on Saturday, we were at an Aboriginal event and the stampede worker that was a white man, he wouldn't look at me. Me and this other woman were in the exact same position and he would only address her who was a woman that was white and wow. me as a native. So I said to her, oh, that was unconscious bias. And she's like, well, I wouldn't have never noticed if you wouldn't have pointed it out. And I said, at no point did he make eye contact to me. At no point was I included in that conversation, even though I was standing beside you, it was you and him that were speaking. They may not even understand what unconscious bias is. And it was such a great example of it. So when you are constantly dismissed and ignored in a society, you know, get ways in your heart. Like you, you're invisible, you don't matter, right? It's hard being part of the workforce in Alberta. So many people have that unconscious bias and that uh, inherent sexism and racism in them. So Yeah, and the, her comment just really illustrates why the problem will continue. Because if white people can't see the racism that's around them, or even their own racism for that matter, then it'll just keep perpetuating itself. They always say to me, oh, Michelle, you have to go get your post-secondary and get a degree and get a master's and get this. But I mean, I see my friends with master's degrees and they're not getting well-paid jobs. They're certainly not getting union jobs. A lot of Indigenous positions are very temporary. So they're usually a small contract, six months, etc. So they'll extract as much information as they can from that Indigenous person, try to incorporate a few things and then let them go if, you know, conveniently the funding runs out. And uh, that's what is happening with people with master's degrees in this city and in, in this uh, province where brilliant people that they would be six figures if they were white in any board room. But because they're natives and they're working in an indigenous position, they get paid very small wages, menial wages, in my opinion, if they get paid at all. Back to unpaid labor, it is so expected for indigenous people to give unpaid labor. Our uh, elders live in uh, poverty as a result. They have all this indigenous knowledge and they'll come to these like shell corporations and such and do wonderful teachings and land acknowledgements and prayers. Yep. And these people think giving them tobacco is enough. And it's like, you know, you force this economy here, the very least that you should be doing. Like if it was retired judge John Riley, you know, that's a $5,000 speaking fee. So when are we going to start seeing Indigenous people as worth a $5,000 speaking fee, especially in a time of so-called reconciliation and a time of so-called uh, treaty partnership understanding? Here in Alberta, man, it's a hate against Indigenous people. I think ultimately people know that they're exploiting land and resources and not being an equitable partner. So they're not respecting treaty. And that's, of course, the opposite of reconciliation, too. So we are really looked down upon here. Yeah. I grew up in North Central Regina, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with that. It's a, a working class neighborhood, and it has a low white population, or at least when I lived there. I was living there in the 80s, but lots of people who are Indigenous, people of color, um, the schools I went to were often very multicultural. As a result, I was able to see the racism. And these are only the obvious forms of racism that I was able to pick up on. I'm sure there was you know, plenty of 
subtle racism that I didn't notice. And I was able to see it in myself too, but like early on, I was able to see racism. And then I moved to Vancouver and I didn't see that anti-Indigenous racism because uh, Indigenous people are invisible in Vancouver. They, they exist, but you just never see them. You see um, South Asians and people of other backgrounds, but you rarely see Indigenous people. And then we moved to Lethbridge and all of a sudden now I'm seeing all this Indigenous racism again. It's quite prevalent here here in Alberta and a lot of people just don't see it. Yeah, I know. Um, my dad is from Yorkton, Saskatchewan. So we would travel out to Yorkton quite a bit in order to see my grandparents. They were the ones who raised me when my parents were splitting up for a few months. I had a lot of ties to Saskatchewan. So much so I didn't know that uh, Ukrainian food was not like a part of the fabric of every place. So when I would go to places in Alberta, I'm like, what do you mean you don't have pierogies? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. What's wrong with your establishment? <laughs> Yeah, I went down to the States. Um, I was living there. I did a Mormon mission to the States and I went to go buy pierogies at the grocery store and they didn't have it. I was like, nowhere. I couldn't buy them anywhere. I was like, what? How can you not have pierogies? <laughs> and then I realized it was just like a uh, Saskatchewan thing. Yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah, it, that's something that I've, I've always I thought was really funny. So now we're having like this third wave of Ukrainians. So I'm like, of course they're welcome here. They've always been welcome here. <laughs> Pierogies are going to make a resurgence. That's right. <laughs> Any final thoughts for our listeners? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, for uh, folks that are, are working with Indigenous people, I know you think you're being kind to us sometimes, but you're not necessarily being kind to us. So a lot of us tolerate your racism and your comments. And I'll give you an example. I've been working on a Friends campaign and people think they're being kind to me, but, and they'll say, oh, McWitch. And I'll smile and I'll nod. And then one person got really aggressive with me about it. I said, McWitch. And I said, wow. okay, well, that's great. You said that. Well, aren't you going to say it back? I'm like, no, that's not my language. Why would I say that? <laughs> You're in Blackfoot territory. We don't say McWitch. I'm Satu Dene. I don't say McWitch. And she was so offended. And I'm like... <laughs> Um, I know you think you're being helpful, but now you're being rude and aggressive to me because you think I'm being rude, aggressive by not saying some other foreign language. Like, I don't go around saying merci beaucoup, even though I'm not French. You know, I, I don't do that. And, and yeah. that's even an official language, you know? <laughs> so, so people sometimes think they're being nice and inclusive when they're actually being even aggressively racist at times. And, you know, by saying things like, oh, you're one of the good ones. You know, you are demeaning the rest of my community. You know, I, I always told people like, well, my aunt's a lawyer. My my uncle is an uh, engineer. They've always worked. I never understood this anti-Indigenous mentality that I was fed my entire life. And it hurts being, you know, demeaned that way. So I just hope that folks who are, you know, fellow workers that, that are working with Indigenous people, like, just let them talk about that and don't have you don't have to interject there and there's uh, lots of resources available i have my podcast but there's so many great indigenous podcasts out there there's like ghost story ones that are way scarier than like mainstream uh, ghost stories, <laughs> let me tell you um you know just lots of fun stuff out there too and i just hope that we can start learning to live together in a better way not segregate each other and like even me i, I have to work on my anti-racism, learning about other cultures, especially from like India, Miss Middle East. You know, there's, there's so many things for me to learn about other cultures and such. And just to encourage other people to do that and try not to do it in an, offen do, uh, an offensive way and just understand we're just people too, trying to live our way. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Michelle, thank you for coming on to the podcast today. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed this conversation. I've learned a lot from you. Where can people follow you and the work that you do? Uh, a lot of Indigenous 101 is really tied to the land. So when people call themselves like a native Calgarian, I laugh so hard inside if they're not native. <laughs> um, I, I named my podcast Native Calgarian. I, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I actually have a second Instagram account because the first one got hacked. I'm on, well, all the podcast services, uh, streaming services that there are. You know, I just talk about politics or whatever the Indigenous issues are of the day and just try to bring in guests that are local talking about the work that they're doing in the hopes that people will access those services or see us in a good way too. Because if you're only seeing a very small minority of, of Indigenous people in such a negative way, then you're not um, part of the solution. We have so many great stories to tell. 
just like any other demographic of people who have some folks that are dealing with mental health. I don't judge all white people based off of the homeless population, you know, but right. we get judged off of the homeless population, yeah. which ironically is totally caused by Canada's um, colonial policies. Exactly. So like the lack of responsibility from Canada on these issues, I will never, my brain will never wrap around, but you know, I just try to live my life, try to show some cool indigenous people doing cool indigenous things. And then, uh, hopefully that inspires my daughter so she doesn't live the life that I had to of hearing these constant negative things and you and I grew up uh, in such a different generation and now we have these podcasts and YouTube channels and TikToks and all these things so uh, the, the new generation they get to see fun stuff cool stuff you know and not stereotypic tropes that the media likes to put out so sure all right I'll yeah. make sure to include those in the podcast description and for anybody who's listening if you are interested in following the alberta worker and the work that we do you can follow us on social media we're on facebook twitter and linkedin you can also go to our website at albertaworker.ca we also have a newsletter there we offer daily weekly and monthly newsletters the daily newsletter is just here's the new article that we just published today the weekly is just a summary of the five articles we published that week and the monthly is a summary of the four most viewed articles that we published that month you can also um, rate and review this podcast if you liked this interview with Michelle as much as I did or maybe even more um, you can support the Alberta worker by going to albertaworker.ca slash support and becoming a member or sending a one-time donation and if you are interested in being a guest on the Alberta worker please email us at podcast at albertaworker.ca thanks so much Michelle for joining us today thank you to all our listeners for tuning in and as always solidarity solidarity